All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, we still have some people trickling in, but I think we're starting to slow down, so I think we can get started. My name is Charlotte Selton, and I work in the American Physical Society's Office of Government Affairs, where I am the organizer for the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction. This is the coalition's first event of this kind, so we are so excited to have you all virtually with us here today. Um, we have an amazing team that has come together today to bring you information and updates about nuclear weapons testing and new, the New START Treaty, which are two crucial policy areas for us to all be aware of. Um, to start us off, I'm gonna hand it over to Professor Stuart Prager. He's a professor of astrophysical science and affiliated faculty with the program on science and global security at Princeton University and he's the former director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. But most importantly today, he's one of the founders and leaders of the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which he's going to tell you all a little bit more about. Thanks, Charlotte. So I, I thought before we start the main event for today, which is a discussion of nuclear testing and new start, I wanted to just brief you for those that aren't familiar with this new endeavor that we started with, through APS called the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction. Uh, the purpose of this coalition that we're beginning to build is to establish a national network of physicists who are willing to participate in advocacy for feasible steps to reduce, to reduce the risk from nuclear weapons. And we're uh, hoping to build a network of physicists who will act not as experts in this area, but as informed uh, citizen scientists, if you like. Uh, this is motivated by the fact that the threat from nuclear weapons remains a grave and persistent, and in fact, uh, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. It's a, uh, a topic that's, compared to the past, is relatively neglected by the public, and it's not even so strongly on the radar of the physics community as a whole. But the premise of our coalition is that the physics community, if it's organized, can be a very influential voice to rein in the danger from nuclear weapons. Uh, as you know, this is sponsored by the APS. We're partnered with the Office of Government Affairs, and we also have some funding from the Carnegie Corporation. There are two goals to our effort. The first is to uh, provide some education or outreach to the physics community or updates on the uh, current threat posed by nuclear weapons. And second uh, is to build the co uh, coalition to advocate. And in, in, for this uh, endeavor, the education component really is in service to the adv advocacy component, which is our uh, ultimate goal. The way we're going to uh, approach this is a, a grassroots effort. We hope to engage the physics community and motivate them to join this coalition uh, by going out to physics institutions and giving colloquia. We have a team of 12 or so experts in nuclear arms control, you'll hear from some of them today, who, are, who, will, who will be going to institutions to give colloquia that overview the whole area of nuclear arms control, as can be done in an hour, and also talks to, talks to physicists at the local site regarding the coalition. Uh, this effort has begun. Um, now we have for the fall, we've scheduled so far about 20 colloquia at different places, and we're scheduling more. Uh, clearly in the near term, this is all done virtually. These will be Zoom colloquia. Um, so this is how we're going to build the coalition and engage the community. It's through site visits to physics institutions, first done virtually. Uh, the advocacy uh, provides a real opportunity for physicists who aren't experts, but are interested in being informed to help uh, reduce this uh, danger. The efforts are made effective because they're steered by the Office of Government Affairs. So the way the coalition works is the, the uh, nuclear arms control experts will identify an issue for advocacy. And then the Office of Government Affairs will use their expertise and their tools to direct the advocacy. So a physicist who participates in this has 
their efforts uh, high, very highly leveraged by the uh, expertise that the government affairs office brings to this. Um, this is a, a, a thumbnail a sketch of what we're about. Uh, today, you're going to hear about two issues that are live advocacy issues. And I just uh, want to conclude by saying, if you're interested in um, learning about the coalition or joining the coalition, you can do that by going to our website, which is called uh, physicistscoalition.org. And you can also, if you'd like to schedule a, a colloquium on this topic at your institution, you can do that also by going to the colloquium website. So with that, I'd, I'd like to um, turn this over to uh, Sebastian Philippe, who's going to uh, tell you about uh, an effort which we are launching to hope to bring in early career scientists to this effort. So Sebastian. Ah, there. I'm, uh, thank you, Stuart, uh, and sorry for the unmute. Um, I'm uh, very excited today to uh, tell you about um, a next generation fellowship that we're starting uh, as part of the coalition. Um, we are looking uh, for uh, next generation to, to uh, train and mentor the next generation expert uh, in this field. Uh, and, inc and increase essentially uh, the diversity of our coalition and strengthen participation, especially from graduate students, postdocs, and early career scientists. Um, this one year fellowship opportunity, um, you can hear more about it on our website. Um, it is essentially here to help uh, mentor, uh, as part of this fellowship, will mentor fellows, uh, introduce them to. Uh, policy writing, um, uh, partnering with them to give talks, also colloquia, uh, train uh, in policy communication, network with uh, our community, um, join also a summer school that uh, Princeton University is organizing on this topic, uh, and so on. So there's more information on our website, and we just launched it today. Uh, that being said, I, I, we, uh, to make this a success, uh, um, we are looking for your help uh, to make this uh, fellowship announcement as visible as possible. Um, so uh, if you have any ideas or if you want to uh, spread the work in into your, to your institutions, please uh, let us know and we'll be able, uh, able and very happy to give you uh, materials on this. Um, again, for more information, see our, our website, uh, physicistscoalition.org. And now I'll hand it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Laura Greco. Hello, everyone. I'm so pleased that so many of you are here. Um, and I'm so pleased that two of the founding members of the Physicists Coalition will be giving talks today. These are two physicists with decades of experience and commitment at the nexus of science and public policy. And you'll see from their bios, they have not let up. <laughs> they have a long and rich history. Um, and I'll give you a short summary. Um, first speaking, we'll have Dr. Steve Fetter, who is the um, Associate Provost and Dean of the Graduate School of the University of Maryland. He also serves as the Acting Executive Director of the Center for Advanced Study of Language. He's been a professor in Maryland School of Public Policy since 1988. Dr. Fetter has also served in numerous capacities in government service, including in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Departments of State Defense and Energy. Uh, despite these enormous commitments, he's also been able to commit to scholarship and mentoring in public service. He's also actively served in the APS and is currently on the panel of on public affairs and other non-governmental organizations that sit at the nexus of science and public affairs. Also joining us is Dr. Frank von Hippel, who is a senior research physicist and professor of public and international affairs emeritus with Princeton's program on science and global security, which he co-founded in 1975. Uh, and he chairs the editorial board of the journal, Science and Global Security, which he co-founded in 1989. Frank started his career in physics research, but shifted his focus to public policy physics. 
that has taken him also into government service in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as service in, non in the non-governmental sector, including leadership positions in APS and on the International Panel on Fissile Materials, which he co-founded. This year, the Journal for Peace and Nuclear Disarmament published a set of interviews reflecting on Dr. Von Hippel's remarkable life and years of engagement on these issues, and I really recommend taking a look at those. Our two panelists will talk about two critical issues. Um, Dr. Fetter will talk about the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, and Dr. Von Hippel will talk about the possibility that the U.S. may resume nuclear testing. I will note that the American Physical Society on July 22nd issued statements on both of these issues, and I'll put a link to these in the chat so you can see them. Um, the speakers will speak for a total of about 25 minutes, and then there will be a short presentation by Charlotte Selton about advocacy actions that you can take on New START and nuclear testing. Please submit your questions as you think of them, um, and we will collect them for the 20 minute question and answer session that will follow the talks. You should see the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you click on it, it'll pull up a window that you can type them into. And uh, with that, I'm going uh, to leave it to Steve to talk about New Start. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I would like to talk about New Start Extension. And New Start, let's see, I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Let me just, ah, oh, there we go. Uh, new Start is the most recent in a series of nuclear arms control agreements between the United States and Russia, before that the Soviet Union. And the series of treaties began over 50 years ago. And I just wanted you to note three things from this uh, chart. Uh, the first is uh, when this process began. It's not often noted that the process began really in 1968 uh, in connection with the signing of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, under which most nations in the world agreed not to acquire nuclear weapons. But the nuclear weapon states agreed in Article uh, 6 of that treaty to begin negotiations on ending the arms race and nuclear disarmament. And in fact, when the United States and the Soviet Union signed that treaty, they announced that they would begin negotiations on arms control agreements to reduce their arsenals. The second thing I'd like you to notice about this slide is that all of these agreements are uh, not in force except for the New START Treaty. All the others have either expired or never entered into force, or the U.S. withdrew uh, from the ABM Treaty and the INF Treaty. And so the only arms control agreement currently in force is New START. And that is why it's so important to talk about the extension of that treaty, because the third thing I'd like you to notice is that this has been a continuous process for over 50 years. And you'll notice there's usually overlap between the expiration of one treaty and the beginning of negotiations on the next treaty. During this entire period, there's been a treaty in force or negotiations about the next treaty, but there currently are no negotiations in progress about a treaty beyond New START. So if New START were to expire, there would be no, there would be no follow-on uh, treaty. So what is New START? Uh, it was uh, signed in April of 2010 and entered into force in February of 2011 for a 10-year period. So that 10-year period uh, expires on February 5th, uh, 2021. But both parties may extend that treaty for an additional five years, uh, simply with an exchange of diplomatic notes. This would not require any action uh, by the uh, US Senate for you know, ratification. The treaty limits uh, strategic nuclear forces in particular, it limits the number of deployed delivery vehicles, ICBMs, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine launch ballistic missiles, and heavy bombers to 700 total on each side. And it limits the number of nuclear weapons that can be deployed on those delivery vehicles to a total of 1,550. And this was about 30% below the level of the previous treaty and 75% below the, uh, the, the START Treaty, uh, 
um, which was really the previous treaty that was in force. The treaty, the New START Treaty, contains the strongest verification and building measures that, that have ever been in place uh, in any treaty uh, between nuclear weapon powers. It requires annual exchanges of data uh, combined with notification on the movement of strategic nuclear weapons. 18 on-site inspections are allowed each year so, that for, so those data exchanges can be confirmed. So for example, US inspectors can go to a Russian ICBM silo or a Russian submarine and request to look at a missile and to uh, verify that the number of warheads on that missile is the same as was provided in the data exchange. And a very important provision, which is sometimes uh, not noted, is uh, the non-interference with national technical means of verification. These are things like uh, spy satellites. So both parties agree not to camouflage or disguise certain sites so that they can be observed by the uh, satellites of the other side, uh, there, thereby simplifying the verification process. So there has, there has been a bit of a debate about extension of New START, uh, and arguments have been raised against the extension. Uh, for example, it's sometimes asserted that, well, Russia cheats on arms control agreements. Uh, therefore, we, we can't trust Russia to abide by the agreement. But uh, in this case, at least, the State Department has assessed, and this is actually a very recent assessment, that Russia is in full compliance with uh, new, the New START Treaty. Uh, another factor is that Russia is developing new strategic nuclear weapons. They're doing this largely in response to US missile defense developments. But it, some people complain that the New START Treaty does not cover those new Russian nuclear weapon systems. But Russia has stated that then its new ICBM, its new heavy ICBM, the Sarmat hypersonic glide vehicle that it's developing for deployment on Sarmat and the SS-19 would in fact be accountable under New START when they are deployed. And the other nuclear weapon systems that are under development by Russia are in early stages of development and wouldn't be deployed before New START uh, would expire even if it were extended. And those systems could be addressed in negotiations on a follow-on treaty. The final uh, argument against extension, and this has really been the central one uh, recently, is that Chinese nuclear forces are not included. China is not a party to the treaty. And so the Trump administration has given a vision of arms control that must include uh, that uh, greed constraints must include Chinese nuclear forces. Uh, but first I would note that Chinese nuclear forces are about 10 times smaller than either the US or Russian nuclear forces. Uh, they're really not comparable uh, in either size or composition to Russian and uh, US forces. But also more importantly, China has outright rejected uh, trilateral negotiations and so uh, there really would be no point to holding out um, uh, to extend New START only if China agreed to participate. And in fact, China has urged uh, the U.S. and Russia to uh, extend New START. In favor of extension, well, as you've seen, New START is the only remaining treaty that constrains the nuclear forces of the United States and Russia. And the U.S. and Russia account for about 90% of all the nuclear weapons in the world. So if New START expired, the United States and Russia would be without agreed limits on their strategic nuclear forces for the first time in nearly 50 years. And remember that linkage back to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. At every Non-Proliferation Treaty review conference, the progress in um, satisfying our commitments under Article 6 of that treaty are, are constantly reviewed, and that, that is a, a key factor in maintaining um, the uh, robustness of the non-proliferation regime. 
Uh, there is no time, as I said, to negotiate a follow-on treaty that includes Russia. That, that would take many years. And a very important factor is that if the treaty expires, so would the vacation and confidence building measures. Without those data exchanges, notifications of weapon movements, on-site inspections, and non-interference with national technical means, intelligence collection demands will increase and confidence in Russian forces will decrease. So for example, hundreds of warheads could be uploaded onto existing missiles without detection, without those on-site inspections and non-interference measures. This could lead to a lack of confidence that would in turn lead to an arms race fueled by worst case assessments. And so that led to the uh, APS uh, board statement, this, this analysis of these arguments to support um, the extension of the New START Treaty. Uh, I think the, the link was provided earlier. And then I'm just going to skip over my last slide. What can you do? You can write to your senators and representatives. And I think uh, we're going to talk about uh, that later. And so with that, I will stop sharing. Thanks very much, Steve. And over to you, Frank. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, the new debate over, uh, over nuclear testing. Um, and um, so we'll start, I'll start with history, the history. Uh, uh, the, uh, this, this debate goes a long way back. Uh, it's, it, the, um, the movement to ban nuclear testing be, be, began in 1954 after the U.S. tested a 15 megaton uh, uh, weapon in the atmosphere in the South Pacific and caused both local fallout, which, which uh, caught a Japanese fishing vessel, and global fallout. So everybody started getting a little bit of radiation from, from our U.S. and Soviet nuclear testing. Uh, that was a very, there was a very powerful combined movement, um, uh, uh, both uh, anti-nuclear testing movement for, for arms control reasons and, and also for environmental reasons, which resulted in 1963 in, in the Partial Test Ban Treaty, which banned testing everywhere except underground, and I'll, I'll get back to the underground testing. Uh, so then a lot happened, but 30 years later, uh, the decision uh, had to be made about whether or not to extend indefinitely the non-proliferation treaty, which had to, to which the non-weapon states had signed up initially only for 25 years. And as, as part of the the deal that actually accomplished that indefinite extension of the commitment of the non-weapon states uh, to the non-proliferation treaty to, to not acquire nuclear weapons, uh, the, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, which are also the five original nuclear weapon states, uh, committed to achieve a comprehensive test ban. Uh, and lo and behold, a uh, year later, uh, it was signed and, and it has been since ratified by 176 countries. But it's still not enforced because there's a list of, of all the countries which had nuclear reactors as of 1995 uh, are required to sign to bring it into force. And, and uh, the US, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea, Iran, and Egypt are all on that list and have not ratified. Uh, the U.S. ratification would be half the battle. Uh, a number of the other countries are waiting for the U.S. to ratify. Uh, but the uh, U.S. Senate, uh, which, which uh, has to have a two-thirds vote uh, to ratify a treaty, uh, refused to do so in 1999. And, and uh, uh, there's, there's been, it, so the, the treaty has remained unratified. Nevertheless, uh, testing has stopped. Uh, the the P5 countries, the, uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, started their testing in 1996. India and Pakistan in 1998, and, and North Korea most recently in 2017. Uh, in, 
Bill Clinton, when he signed the U.S. for the U.S., uh, stated that you know that this was the longest, uh, hardest fought prize in arms control history, and and I think that was not an overstatement. Uh, in the, the last development pre-Trump was uh, in the, during the Obama administration, when the UN Security Council, uh, in in the absence of of uh, the treaty come coming into force called upon all states to uh, refrain from conducting any nuclear weapon explosion or any other nuclear, any other nuclear explosion. Uh, now we come to the Trump administration. Uh, uh, starting in 2020, uh, there have been a drumbeat of developments which, which have uh, raised alarm. Uh, in April, uh, the Trump administration uh, declared that Russia had to, uh, conducted nucle nuclear weapon experiments with a non-zero yield, nuclear yield, and therefore was violating at least the U.S. interpretation of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, in May, uh, there was a discussion which was leaked uh, about the possibility of a rapid U.S. Te test. The rationale given was, was that um, this would goose uh, Russia and China to, to uh, engage in trilateral nuclear arms control discussions, which, which the U.S. was seeking. Uh, uh, more, more recently, uh, John Bolton, the former National Security Advisor, said that, in fact, the, the National Security Council had been discussing uh, uh, testing for two years. Uh, he, his rationale was that the U.S. He wanted to check that they still work, uh, but the uh, National Nuclear Security Agency, which uh, is, has responsibility for maintaining U.S. nuclear weapons, argued that there was no need. Then in, in June, uh, the, uh, the, there was a party line vote uh, under which the Senate Armed Services Committee included $10 million uh, uh, in the in the fiscal year 21 budget, which uh, be, the fiscal year 21 begins in October, uh, for testing, if necessary, the House reacted uh, and uh, by uh, including in in its version of the uh, National Defense Authorization Act a prohibition on funding uh, uh, to conduct or make preparation for any explosive nuclear weapons test. Uh, the the so so the, this difference between the two uh, versions, the Senate and the House versions of the uh, of the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, has to be resolved. Uh, a House Senate conference uh, of the members of those of the of the uh, House and Senate Armed Services Committee uh, will be the venue for debating that. Uh, and it, as far as I know, uh, it, it hasn't yet been scheduled, and, and it could begin as early, you know, as early as this month or uh, after the election. Uh, so, what is at stake? Um, most importantly, you know, the the, the linkage to the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and the undermining of the of the credibility of the Non-Proliferation Treaty if the weapon states. Uh, renege on, on, I mean, the, the weapon states have made an, an, a commitment under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to, to, uh, to pursue nuclear disarmament. Test ban was supposed, supposed to be the first step. Uh, and if we reneged on that first step, it would be do terrible damage uh, uh, to the Non-Proliferation Treaty where, where there's already a lot of complaining that, that uh, the weapon states haven't been getting on with it with nuclear disarmament. Uh, other countries would likely resume testing. Uh, the US con has conducted more than half the total tests by the, of the nine nuclear armed states. Uh, the uh, India and Pakistan, we only conducted a few, uh, and they certainly, and, and they did not uh, test a thermonuclear warhead. They would certainly want, uh, welcome an opportunity to continue down that track. North Korea has conducted one thermonuclear test, uh, probably would like to conduct more. Uh, 
China has, has only conducted 45 tests. UK uh, actually was tested in Nevada, was cut off on its last test by the Clinton administration uh, when it decided to, uh, to uh, have a moratorium joining Russia and, and, uh, and so on. I mean, in short, that it would be difficult to get everybody to stop again. Now, the the I've mentioned the the uh, the argument that was that was made that uh, maybe a test would would inspire uh, China and Russia to get into to, to trilateral disarmament. I think that's a disingenuous argument. It was probably made by Marshall Billingsley, uh, President Trump's special envoy for for arms control who is in his previous incarnation actually organized the Senate Re Republican uh, defeat of the ratification of the, of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, then the, there's the Bolton argument that we want to see whether they still work. And, and one way that Bolton expressed that was having 5,000 nuclear warheads is like having 5,000 to Toyotas in a garage. You want to know when, to, when you turn the key, it works the first time, because if it doesn't work, it doesn't work at all. Well, that's, you know, if you were spending a billion dollars a year on making sure the Toyota worked, I suspect it would work. And that, and we are spending at least a billion dollars a year supporting various tests to make sure our nuclear weapons work. Uh, and then finally, is the argument that, that uh, Russia, and you know, we don't know about Russia, about China, perhaps China uh, is cheating. Uh, and these are the arguments that the that the administration used to set up the, uh, the U.S. exit from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces and Open Skies Treaty. Now, on reliability, um, this is a diagram of, 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 of what, what a modern nuclear weapon looks like. But on, on reliability, uh, uh, the Congress has, requires that every year uh, the three uh, U.S. nuclear weapon direct, uh, lab directors and the command in, commander in chief of the Strategic Command Commission independent reviews of each warhead, including red teams, uh, and report to Congress whether there's any need to test any one of the weapons for because of doubts about reliability, safety, or, or military effectiveness. Um, the the uh, this billion dollar program, a year program I mentioned, tests every testable component, all the electronics, uh, the implosions here in, in, uh, uh, in the diagram, uh, you see uh, the fission trigger, there's uh, an implosion system is, is tested, uh, and it, it's boosted uh, with uh, deuterium tritium gas, which fuses, make a burst of neutron, which increases the, the yield of the the, of the primary that can't be tested, and that, and that, uh, and there's a lot of modeling and and so on that uh, that is that it, uh, that the, the labs depend on to assure themselves that it would still work, and they've also increased the amount of boost gas there to make, uh, to give them an extra margin. Then there's the secondary, which is imploded by X-rays, the ablation uh, caused by X-rays from the primary. And there seems to be very little concern that if the, uh, if the primary goes off, that the secondary uh, won't go off. So that's just in a, in a nutshell. Now, with regard to verification, you know, the, the argument that, that, um, that maybe that Russia, maybe China are cheating. First of all, uh, there is an international monitoring system that, that uh, supports, that, um, that reports to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, uh, seismic, uh, hydroacoustic, infrasound, radionuclear stations. Uh, the 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 and and basically uh, any any uh, nuclear test could be could be detected down to very low yield. The the big focus of people who have been arguing that the that the test ban uh, would not be adequately uh, verifiable are, is is the limits of the seismic detection, and this shows you uh, the the uh, uh, the decoupling scenario, which was actually uh, uh, is the reason uh, why the partial test ban 
treaty uh, did not ban underground uh, testing because of the verification doubts that were raised uh, by this decoupling theory. That in the original version of the decoupling theory, uh, you you would have a un huge underground cavity, and which would reduce the yield of up to a 300 kiloton bomb down to one kiloton seismic signal, which at that time um, would would uh, you know was sort of the, the, the limit of detection. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. This is me. Sorry. I there was a clarifying question, and I think this might be the right time to answer it. Um, okay. A listener is asking if you are going to define, for these purposes, what you mean by a nuclear explosion, for example, is a national ignition facility ignition shot a nuclear explosion? No, yeah, yeah. Of this discussion. The, the national, the, the fusion, uh, pure fusion implosions by lasers uh, were, were exempted from the, from the, the test ban treaty explicitly. Um, so, so the, you, you see, but ba basically, um, the, uh, the Academy has done periodic reviews. The last one, National Academy of Sciences, the last one was they concluded that uh, we, we're really down to detecting the equivalent of a, a, a non decoupled uh, explosion of, of tens of tons, uh, so that, that uh, it would be a decoupling of uh, rough China or uh, or Russia could conceivably decouple a one kiloton or below uh, explosive down to uh, a probability where of less than uh, they, uh, less than ten percent detection. So the question is, is that important? Um, and uh, the, the well, they concluded that uh, basically um, uh, Russia and China could not do do much uh, of interest uh, to advance the state of the art that they have achieved uh, below one kiloton. Uh, and, uh, um, yeah, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, and, 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 oh yes, also that the, uh, the lab directors, uh, when asked whether they would be interested in doing very low yield tests, I uh, said, no, they, they, uh, it wouldn't benefit the U.S. program much. So the, the, the claim, in fact, is, is that um, Russia has been uh, conducting hydronuclear tests. Uh, these are not uh, detectable. You know, we're talking about a uh, nuclear yield of about not 10 kilotons, 10 kilograms of TNT explosive uh, equivalent. So that you know, which which would be basically con conducted inside a a, um, a containment vessel. Uh, so that that the allegation, there's no way to dispute the um, Trump administration's claim. There's no physical evidence that they could have though uh, of this so-called violation. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, e even much larger test uh, uh, is judged by the National Academy. A review as not significant, and by the lab directors is not significant. Uh, the on the with regard, I, I've also already gone through the uh, what we do with regard to reliability. Uh, the the uh, this has been uh, going. These reviews for reliability have been going going on since 1996. They, every year, the all three lab directors and the uh, chairman of the strategic command. Uh, a report to Congress that there's no need to test any warhead, but things could change. And, you know, maybe the lab directors and chairman of the, the strategic command could be changed and, and would have a different view. Uh, this, the, this, that, the resulting debate could not be conducted publicly because, the, you know, whatever the problem was uh, would, would be secret, but Congress could have hearings and, and invite people with different views uh, to, to debate that. Um, so, um, I think I've made the other points and, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, quickly, we'll have Charlotte talk about some of the advocacy actions that you can take on these two topics. Thank you so much, Frank and Steve. Um, 
They did a great job giving a primer on why nuclear testing and New START are such crucial policy areas for us to engage on and take action on. So before we get to Q&As, I want to really quickly let you all know about two opportunities that we have right now for you to take action. So firstly, for New START, Senator Markey has introduced a resolution in the Senate, um, Senate Resolution 673, that urges the current administration to extend New START for five more years. There's currently 17 co-sponsors, but we want to grow that number um, so that it sends a very strong message about how important New START is to our country. Um, so we have set up a portal that I will drop a link to in the chat that will let you contact your senators to thank them if they're already supporting this resolution and to ask them to sign on if they're not yet co-sponsoring this resolution. And then we have another action to help you prevent the funding going into nuclear testing that Frank did a great job mentioning. So as he said, currently um, there's a conflict between the Senate and the House. The National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, is an annual bill that sets the Department of Defense's budget for the next year. Right now, in the fiscal year 2021 bill, the Senate has $10 million to prepare a nuclear test site, while the House bill completely prohibits funds being used for nuclear testing. They're going to go into conference, maybe as soon as the end of this month, more likely after the election in, in November, and that's when lawmakers are going to hash out um, whether or not that funding ends up in the final bill. We want to make sure that we send a strong message that nuclear testing is not needed to secure um, our nuclear arsenal and that it in fact would be a dangerous step for the U.S. to take, um, which is why if you have a senator or house representative who sits on the Senate or House Armed Services Committee, we're asking you to contact them today and urge them to keep this funding out of the final bill. I'll drop a link um, into the chat with the portal for you to do this and we'll automatically find um, any senators or representatives that you have that sit on the relevant committees. Um, in this portal, you'll be able to decide if you want to send an email, make a call or tweet. We've provided some pre-written emails and tweets for you to send but you'll notice that they're editable and I really encourage you to take a minute and personalize the email, right? Why this issue is important to you. For me, bills make an impact on elected officials, but when it clearly comes from you, it makes a much greater impact. Um, so please take less than five minutes to contact one of your officials and take action with us today. So now let's get to questions. Thank you, Laura. Great, thanks so much, Charlotte. Um, we've had quite a few questions. I'm going to, since we only have about 15 minutes till the hour, I'm gonna group some of them together. Um, and the first I'll address to Dr. Fetter um, on New START. Um, uh, essentially, what's your assessment whether the US is interested in renewing the New START treaty? And that of course may be administration dependent, um, but why does this administration seem to object um, and possibly related is, do you see any links drawn between the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty and New START? Well, it's, it's hard to say what anyone's real motive is. All we can rely on is, you know, what they, what they say. I would note that the people who are responsible for arms control, have been responsible for arms control in this administration, have been some of the strongest opponents of previous arms control uh, agreements. Uh, but uh, take them at their word that what they really, or what the president is really interested in, is a treaty that would input, uh, that would place constraints on the Chinese arsenal. Uh, with regard to the, the link between INF and New START, there's really not any direct link. They covered different categories of nuclear weapons, INF, uh, applied only to ground-launched intermediate-range missiles. Uh, but there is a political linkage, and that is that the United States had accused Russia of violations of the INF Treaty. Uh, and ha you know, having worked in the um, administration, in the Obama administration at that time, I, I agreed with those um, assessments. 
but I thought that the um, correct approach was to continue to persuade Russia to come in compliance, to come into compliance with that treaty rather than to uh, withdraw from the treaty. Great, thank you. There are um, pull some some questions uh, that you for Frank. Um, you did talk about this in your talk a bit um, about whether Russia and China were cheating, um, conducting very low yield explosive tests, um, and again whether they would get any advantage from that. Uh, uh, maybe you could underscore your assessment of that. Um, and I guess related to that is if countries resumed nuclear testing, who would advantage most? Yes, and, and by the way, I invite Steve to, to uh, Steve is certainly very knowledgeable on these issues as well. And so if he wants to add something. Um, uh, at the level of, of cheating that's beyond detection, uh, there's really uh, no advantage um, uh, for the, those for two, no real benefit for those very low yield weapons. Uh, you, you can you can basically test the primary, but but you can you can test the uh, you can test the primary without boosting a fission primary, uh, but but you can't really uh, test the boosted primary. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry. What was the the, the second half? If uh, nuclear testing were to resume, who would oh, yeah. that who would, who would advantage? Yeah, the the um, well, I, it would advantage most. I think the, the countries which have done the least testing, and of course, since the U.S. has done more than you know more testing than any other country, it would probably advantage advantage us least. Of course, you, you can argue that um, that uh, you know, and, and I, I would that these advances whatever the advances are in nuclear weapons don't uh, don't change the basic fact that that um, a nuclear war uh, you know has to be avoided uh, with any vintage of, of nuclear weapons I mean it, it, uh, if we want to preserve civilization Steve did you have anything you'd like to add to that those questions uh, no okay great um, so we're well, turning back to New Start. Uh, one is a quick technical question, and it's whether Russian and U.S. inspectors are on duty in both countries at all times under the New Start protocols. And what do you think um, the prospects are for a future uh, for a follow-on treaty, which includes the U.S., Russia, and perhaps also China, the U.K., and France? Um, perhaps where the size of the arsenals the size of the arsenals are traded against allowing the signatories to modernize those arsenals. So on the first question, uh, no, U.S. inspectors are not continuously on site in Russia and vice versa. Uh, they, there's a process for requesting an inspection and then a certain amount of time to arrive on the site. And uh, the treaty permits 18 such inspections by each side uh, each year. Uh, with regard to the prospects for a future treaty that would include the P-5, I think it will take many years uh, to achieve that. I would note that, you know, the U.S. and Russia have been at this for 50 years, so we have a lot of experience in negotiating arms control agreements. We have a common language and vocabulary. Uh, the, the P-5 process, there is a P-5 process that began in 2007, uh, with all of the uh, official nuclear weapon states, but it has made very little progress uh, over that over that time. And I think a big part of the reason is the U.S. and Russian arsenals are so different, so much larger. The other arsenals have been uh, close, much closer to what is regarded as a minimum deterrent, just the the sort of uh, minimum uh, nuclear force that is required. Uh, for an assured deterrent. And so there, there isn't really a, a basis for entering into an agreement as equal partners with the U.S. and Russia. Could I add something? Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the um, China is increasing the size of its, of its arsenal. 
uh, and uh, uh, and so that's a concern because because uh, you know at some point we do have to get beyond bilateral arms control with with Russia. And uh, and so China growing uh, raises the the floor at, at, uh, for how far we can go down uh, on a bilateral basis with Russia. But China's increase uh, looks like it may have been triggered by our leaving the the uh, ballistic missile the ABM treaty, the, which which basically uh, limited U.S. and and Russian. Uh, ballistic missile defense that they that they are concerned that um, that that uh, a U.S. first strike and then a defense against their surviving missiles might might in fact um, uh, bring their deterrent into question of, of U.S. Uh, attack and and therefore they have to increase their offensive forces. So so. Uh, just wanted to say that the ballistic missile defense and offensive arms, nuclear arms control are tightly linked. And, uh, and, and that's also true in the case of Russia. Um, uh, a couple of questions on testing. Um, this is a good one. How much insight does the US have into the equivalent in other countries of the stockpile stewardship program? Does the U.S. feel confident that other countries are also able to certify their warheads without explosive testing? Uh, I, I talked with both Chinese and and, uh, and Russian weaponeers, uh, you know, before 2000, uh, and um, they were both very confident that uh, that they that they could maintain their stockpiles. I don't think they're putting as much money into into their stockpile, so-called stock, science-based stockpile stewardship programs. As the U.S. is, but but uh, but they 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 didn't um, anticipate any problems with, with maintaining the reliability of their weapons. And how how important is the ten million dollars that the Senate Armed Services Committee put into the budget for supporting a new test? Um, seems like a small amount. Um, could it be done without that money? If they don't get that money, can they not do it? How does how does that figure into whether or not the testing might go forward? Yeah, the 10 million is a, is a very modest amount actually for a nuclear test. Uh, it, basically, it, it, would, it wouldn't cover an instrumented test, uh, you know, with, a, with elaborate instrumentation. Uh, but, but you could put a, a nuclear warhead down a hole and set it off, and fill the hole and set it off, which, which seems to be what, what, the, uh, what was being proposed uh, in the National Security Council. Uh, so it, it it wouldn't tell you more than than uh, that the thing went off, and if it if if it went off with a lower yield or than than expected, it wouldn't tell you why because it wouldn't be an instrumented test. So the, the but the uh, basically on the house side they've said you can you cannot spend any money on testing, and so that is the leverage that Congress has. Uh, you know, in this, in this, uh, if they, if, if the Senate and the House agree. As a follow-on question to that, does the U.S. still have the technical expertise to conduct a nuclear test safely and to understand what those results mean? What the what the, uh, the National Nuclear Security Administration says in its annual stockpile stewardship program uh, report is that it could conduct uh, a test, uh, but it would have to, uh, uh, it would have to raise some safety. It would have to, uh, it couldn't, it couldn't do that with all, with, uh, with all the safety regulations that it would ordinarily impose. And, uh, you know, but that it, but, but that it, it thought it, it could do it, if, if a, a rapid test, if, if instructed, I, I can't remember Six to nine months, I think, is, was the uh, the amount of time that they said they it would it would take bef between order being ordered to do so and and actually conducting the explosion. Thanks. There are an enormous number of good questions, many very pointed technical questions, which maybe we can um, if we have if you can stick around afterwards. But I did want to pull back to some of these the more interesting general questions. So we had a few about 
nuclear disarmament. One is, is nuclear disarmament wise. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts to share about the treaty to ban nuclear weapons, um, which is only a few signatures away from entry into force? Um, and whether there are parallel efforts focusing on delivery systems rather than nuclear weapons, including non-ICBM uh, technologies. Steve, do you want to? Uh, I'd rather not comment on the ban treaty. Okay. Uh, you asked if there were uh, arms control efforts focused on delivery vehicles. The uh, New START and previous arms control agreements between the US and Russia, the Soviet Union, were focused mostly on the delivery vehicles because they were so um, um, unique the, and distinctive. Uh, you cannot hide ICBMs or and ballistic missile submarines, uh, long range bombers. And so that was the key tool uh, for controlling, uh, for placing limits on nuclear weapon arsenals. I, I see that there are also some questions on tactical nuclear weapons. And one of the difficulties, there was a lot of interest in also limiting tactical nuclear weapons, but one of the challenges is that there are no distinctive delivery vehicles. Almost every vehicle that could be used to deliver a tactical nuclear weapon could and is mostly used to deliver conventional uh, weapons. And so uh, that really forces the focus to be on, uh, on the warhead. And in fact, the, the Obama administration had proposed uh, to Russia to begin negotiation on a follow-on treaty to New START that did uh, limit all nuclear weapons, including non-deployed nuclear weapons and, and tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, but uh, Russia did not uh, take us up on that. I believe the Trump administration is also interested in that because of the concerns over the much larger number of tactical, Russian tactical nuclear weapons. Maybe I'll take a, a crack at the ban treaty since Steve passed on that. The, the ban treaty would, would uh, prohibit uh, the possession of nuclear weapons. Uh, for the parties that have ratified the ban treaty, uh, it'll come into force for those parties when 50 countries have ratified and it is you know, the, the advocates hope that, uh, that will happen maybe this year, maybe next year. Um, I, the, of course, none of the weapon states have, have uh, signed the ban treaty. None of the nuclear, the nine nuclear armed states have. Um, and so it would not apply to them. Uh, it also, I don't think any of their allies, which are under the so-called U.S nuclear umbrella, the NATO countries, Japan, Australia, South Korea, are, are, have, have uh, joined the ban treaty. So, um, so you know, they, they basically have thereby expressed a, uh, a preference to remain uh, for the US umbrella. I don't think um, any of the other states have an umbrella beyond, beyond cover that doesn't cover just themselves. Uh, so, so, um, but I think, you know, my personal view is that the, the ban treaty is a way of, of uh, putting pressure on, on, uh, and, uh, on the weapon states uh, to, to uh, delegitimize their possession of nuclear weapons and, and for them to get on to the, with their commitment under the non-proliferation treaty uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, on the nuclear disarmament agenda. Well, thank you so much. We are at five o'clock, um, which is our stop time. Uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise, which is considerable. Um, there are further questions that we may be able to answer them in some form. I not going to make promises on your behalf, but, but there are some really interesting things left on the table. And I appreciate so many of you coming to this uh, presentation, more than 200, which is a great sign for physicists. Um, and I think Charlotte is going to give us a, a, a sign off. Thank you, Laura. And thank all of you for coming and giving up your afternoon today um, to learn a little bit more about what's going on in the nuclear weapons policy world. 
Um, and thank you for your thoughtful and great questions. I am so sorry that we couldn't get to them all, but there were just so many um, very, very interesting questions. Um, but I hope that you all learned a little something and I hope that you all take action after this. Um, follow those links, talk to your senators, talk to your Congress people, um, and make sure that we show them that nuclear weapons um, are a policy area that this, um, the physics community prioritizes um, and make sure that your voice is heard on this issue. So thank you all so much and have a great evening.